Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Welcome to class. Today we are going to talk about a very important and debated issue in language acquisition theories called critical period hypothesis. So when we say critical period, we refer to the window time during the early childhood and the debate whether the acquisition of language can be linked to a certain window period. And critical period as a phrase has been used in multiple disciplines, cognitive sciences, psychology, but in, in uh, neurology for that matter, but in linguistics, it was popularized by uh, Eric Lenberg in his work in uh, you know, of 1967. We will talk about critical period hypothesis today. But we be, before we move to the hypothesis, let us understand the background uh, and the context in which this idea was popularized, debated, and till date it has been debated. Certain scholars endorse the idea, endorse the view, and uh, majority of them. In second language acquisition theorists, for example, oppose this view. But look at the look at the uh, way a human child acquires a language, specifically first language. Human child is endowed with a remarkable ability to communicate, right? And the speed of learning in the early childhood is beyond our imagination, the way children learn, right, can be contrasted with the way adults learn and we understand that adults have to make a lot of effort in learning second language or third language, which becomes a child's play for a young human child, specifically early childhood. So, small babies babble and coo and cry. This is how they start producing noise and they send messages vocally and non-vocally. But by the end of first year, they start to imitate words and speech sounds and perhaps towards the end of one year, they are able to utter their first word. By the time they reach 18 months of their age, their vocabulary items increase exponentially and they start two word, three word utterances, which is also known as telegraphic messages. So, they do not have complete sentences, but two words, three words utterances they start doing. At the end of three years, the children acquire amazingly huge vocabulary within no time and they construct complete sentences that are able to engage in a longer discussion, longer speech and uh, they chatter non-stop. And by the time they enter a school, they have almost become linguistically adult. That remarkable achievement forces us to look at the acquisition process closely, what goes in, right? So, in order to understand first language acquisition, we have two clearly distinct theoretical positions, though they are poles apart. One is the behaviorist paradigm, the behaviorist approach, behaviorist theory. 
and the other is called generative paradigm you call generative paradigm or innate hypothesis proposed by noam chomsky in 1957 bf skinner came up with his monumental work named as verbal behavior this work is considered a summary of the behaviorist approach so behaviorist believed that human child acquires a language in a rich environment with stimulus and response chain if you look at the deductions from behaviorist paradigm we can deduct that they believe that child is born with tabula rasa a blank slate roughly translates in english right that means they bear no preconceived notions about the world and about the language to so their tabula rasa and then their understanding and learning is shaped by the environment slowly conditioned through various schedules of reinforcement so stimulus response chain and various different schedules of reinforcement and they believe that language is a fundamental part of total human behavior so language is a verbal behavior part of total human behavior and this approach focuses on externally perceptible aspects of linguistic behavior so it's purely externally perceptible linguistic behavior so this is the behaviorist position this position was severely criticized by noam chomsky and he came up with two hypotheses linguistic nativism and innateness hypothesis so he said that language is native to human it's there with us since our birth and we have got a, in an innate capability to acquire a language a program like that if you go by the steven pinker's uh, term the human child's brain is hardwired to acquire a, lang a language so it's a biological adaptation so we have two theoretical positions and in order to support innateness hypothesis that language is native and innate chomsky invokes two important ideas number 1 language acquisition device and number 2 universal grammar which later turned into principles and parameters so he said that human language human mind contain this language acquisition device a child is born with language acquisition device and when we say language acquisition device let us not be confused with some physical or physiological mechanism it is it is an innate apparatus a mechanism that enables a child to learn a language it does not have any physiological manifestation but a hypothesis and that represents innate capability of human mind so it's not don't uh, be confused with the word device it is not a physiological organ that we are referring to but this idea of language acquisition device you know contrasts with the behaviorist idea of tabula rasa so at one extreme you say human mind is a blank slate no perceptible preconceived uh, you know idea about the world and language and at another theoretical position which is chomsky position we say human child is born with language acquisition device so there is an innate capability to learn a language so language is native to human 
right? Interestingly, both of them emphasize on the role of environment. Behaviorists emphasize in terms of externally perceptible linguistic input. And Chomsky acknowledges the role of external environment to the extent where the primary linguistic data is required to trigger this mechanism. So, the environment works as a trigger, but in behaviorist paradigm, we see environment, right, to large extent determines the learning process. There is a fine difference. At behaviorist position, we have externally language as externally perceptible human behavior, but in Chomskin paradigm, in Chomskin enterprise, we have language as native and innate. So, human children are programmed biologically to acquire a language. So, these are two theoretical positions. Now, after Chomskyan arrival in the scenario, lots of criticism and you know uh, support were generated in the favor or against this theory. So, critics criticize Chomsky's abstract computational uh, you know, thrust on language acquisition process, right? How mind computes learning, and at the same time, other critics emphasize a huge role of context and environment that we have already discussed in linguistic competence versus communicative competence. But this idea that language is acquired by the human child in his or her early childhood, right, gained currency and support. And this is the background for this hypothesis called critical period hypothesis. So the de de debate was. Uh, whether there is a biological time window that enables a child to acquire a language. Can we have, uh, you know, clarity on the break po breaking point, at which point? Chomsky says puberty. So, roughly 12, 13 years of age. Now, the whole idea of universal grammar, the principles of language proposed by Chomsky, right? So, the child has you know, access to universal grammar, principles of language, right? And the environment helps the child to set the parameters. And this LED or universal grammar does not stay for this universal grammar rules, the principles do not stay forever. The moment we set the parameters, the rest of the rules or the principles vanish, disappear. That means there is a threshold. And this was the triggering point to bring in this critical period idea that can be linked learning or acquisition of language, first language, to certain biological window period, right, certain biological window. So, the critical period hypothesis underlines the extent to which the ability to acquire language by human child is biologically linked to age. And this hypothesis claims that there is an ideal time window to acquire language in a linguistically rich environment after which a language acquisition becomes difficult and requires a lot of effort by a learner or a child to do so. And uh, this though this theory, this this claim is also refuted and debated, but the importance of this idea cannot be overruled and underestimated. 
and support for this idea comes from various feral and deaf children. So this hypothesis was first proposed by neurologist Wilder Penfield and Lammer Roberts in their 1959 book called Speech and Brain Mechanism and the further discussed in another work by Penfield Conditioning the Uncommitted Cortex for Language Learning published in Brain volume 88 uh, volume 4 from 787 pages to 798 pages but this idea was <coughs> imported but this idea was imported and popularized in linguistics by eric lenberg in 1967 in the book biological foundations of language published by willie and sons and from there this critical period hypothesis came into discussion. And the support for this hypothesis come fr comes from the cases of deaf and feral children who were subjected to severe early childhood abuse, who remained isolated, and who were deprived of social interactions. And uh, in that case, the learning or the requisition could not be triggered. Some of such cases are like, you know, Jenny, the case of Jenny. You can find the case of Jenny available on online and you can just go through the case study. It's available online. If you Google uh, Jenny, the feral child, you will find the entire case history. Another case is Isabel, right? But there is a difference. And that gives support to this, this claim. The case of Jenny is interesting. Jenny was a feral child. Her father judged in the early age of Jenny that she is retarded. And he locked her up in the basement. Sometimes she would be changed and isolated and, uh, you know, spent nights in the, in the washroom. She was completely denied any outside social interaction. And when she was discovered at the age of 13, she had already reached the age of poetry. She was discovered at the age of 13. And then she lived long after that, but she could not acquire a language in a normal way and she could not have command, she could not get command over the language, she could not communicate properly. She learned some life skills to survive, but as far as linguistic competence or the language competence is concerned, she could not acquire it properly. And this supports the idea that she had already crossed that critical period of acquisition of language. Another case is of Isabel, who was discovered and rescued at the age of six and a half. And with training and exposure and critical observation and examinations, she acquired language, right? And that also proves that because the child was discovered before the age of puberty, before this critical period, the child could learn and acquire a language perfectly fine. And if you look at these cases, and there are several other cases which support this idea, right? And you can find these cases and their details. It's available on online. You just search for it and you'll get it. And I recommend that you read these cases. So critical period hypothesis 
also gives ground to Chomsky's idea of LED and UG. Chomsky's idea of triggering of LED with primary linguistic data. Right? Chomsky's idea of poverty of stimulus. So in both the cases that we are we have mentioned referred to here today, uh, this idea gets support that because the process was not triggered, because the acquisition was not triggered, the child could not acquire language properly, and the case of Jenny, the feral child, you know. Uh, do, you know, explains. It's self-explanatory. It explains why she couldn't acquire a language even after lots of efforts on part of a team of doctors and linguists. However, the other case, Isabel case, the child could acquire the language. So the idea that a window, a biological window, can be attached to the process of acquisition of language gets verified by these cases. So critical period hypothesis refers to the claim that acquisition of language is subject to a biologically a biological critical period, a biological age. And after that certain threshold that is roughly 12 to 13 years of age, so 13 years for that matter. After that threshold, it becomes really difficult for us to learn a language. The way a native speaker learns, the way a normal child learns. The significance of early childhood exposure to language and rich environment, linguistic environment gets accentuated with the fact that if you look at the learning patterns of adults, adults find it very difficult to learn second, third, fourth language. However, in the case of compound bilingualism or compound multilingualism, we find that children find it very easy to, to acquire two, three languages at a time without much efforts. Interestingly, when the child reaches the school, the child is already linguistically adult. So without any structured training, without any structured instruction, and without any programmed schedule of reinforcement, child is able to do so with limited trigger available in terms of primary linguistic data. Chomsky also explains the quality of data available to the child, which is very poor, fuzzy, and incomplete, idiosyncratic. But still, learning is complete and perfect. That gives I, you know, support to this idea of innateness. So, critical period hypothesis complements this innate idea, right? This native hypothesis that language is native to human and human children are programmed, hardwired, biologically programmed to acquire a language, which is not the case with any other species in the animal kingdom. So, this is a very important phenomenon, critical period hypothesis, and it gets support from lots of cases reported of deaf children, of feral children, and it establishes the threshold of age of 13. So the early childhood becomes so crucial, so critical for us to acquire a language. This is critical period hypothesis. So we'll continue this discussion further. This is it for now. Thank you.